Hi, everybody. I'm Anna Harvey, president of the Social Science Research Council, and welcome to the Council's seventh centennial lecture. We're hosting 10 centennial lectures this year to celebrate the founding of the Social Science Research Council 100 years ago and the achievements of the social and behavioral sciences over the last 100 years. Every centennial lecture is given by a faculty member from one of the institutions in our college and university fund for the social sciences and is focused on one of 10 important policy issues that represent each decade of the last 100 years of the council's work. Our prior centennial lectures focused on immigration, social insurance, racial discrimination, economic development, the green revolution and education, important research topics for the council in the 1920s through the 1970s. And you can find recordings of all these lectures on our centennial lectures website. This month, we're focusing on the work of social scientists to understand how to address persistent poverty, which was central to the Council's work in the 1980s. In that decade, the Council established multiple research committees to study the problem of persistent urban poverty. The faculty involved in these committees included Elijah Anderson, professor of sociology at Yale, William Julius Wilson, professor of sociology at Harvard, and Mary Jo Bain, professor of public policy at Harvard. The committees sponsored fellowships and organized multiple convenings, which attracted staff members from the federal agencies and congressional committees. The work of these committees was founded on the premise that persistent poverty likely has, is influenced by multiple factors and is a complex phenomenon. But in the 1980s, we didn't have very good tools for distinguishing between those factors that are merely correlated with poverty and those factors that are causing poverty. In the 40 years since the SSRC sponsored this work, social and behavioral scientists have worked on developing better tools to identify the specific causal mechanisms that are generating persistent poverty so that we can target policies to address those mechanisms. One area that has received considerable attention in the last decade has been the relationship between eviction and poverty. Ethnographic accounts of the economic distress experienced by evicted families have led many to focus on the potential role of eviction in worsening poverty in the United States. But is eviction a cause of economic distress or merely a symptom, or is it both? We're very fortunate to have with us today, Winnie Van Dyke of College and University Fund for the Social Sciences member institution, Yale University, who has been working on these questions and who has some of the very first, and I think the very best answers to those questions. I'm grateful that she was able to find the time to be with us today. Feel free to post questions in the Q&A as Winnie is talking, and I'll field them to her after she winds up. We have about an hour, and we'll try to save about 15 minutes of that hour for Q&A. So Winnie, thank you very much for being here with us today, and the floor is yours. Hi. Uh... Thank you very much, um, Dr. Harvey and the Social Science Research Council for having me. Uh, just give me a moment to deal with getting my slides up. Okay. Um, okay, please let me know if um, if there are any issues there. Um, so, okay, so I'm, I'm very happy to talk to you today about um, eviction and poverty. And in particular, uh, I'm gonna discuss what we can learn about these issues from uh, large-scale linked administrative data sets. Um, so when Dr. Harvey reached out to me to um, see whether I was able to give this lecture uh, on the occasion of the SSRC centennial, I spent a little bit of time looking uh, at the history of the Social Science Research Council um, as an institution. And one of the things I learned that I didn't know um, was that in the report, um, that led to the to the foundation of the SSRC. Sorry, give me one second to move this out of my way. There. Okay. Um, the report uh, that was written by a committee appointed in 1921 uh, to consider the state of policy relevant social science. Um, that report outlined several challenges for um, reproduce for producing credible and re reliable social science to guide public policy. 
um, specifically data availability, um, ob objectivity and in the interpretation of data, uh, measurement issues of various kinds, uh, and causality. The report uh, used a, a few more words to, to uh, characterize these things, but I, I think I'm paraphrasing this uh, reasonably well. Um, and so um, what I'm going to try to do today is, uh, as we uh, think about um, the, the research that I'm going to discuss about eviction and poverty is, is think through how much progress have we been able to make. Uh, a lot of the, the challenges that were outlined in 1923 um, are arguably still challenges today, um, but we think that we've made progress on at least a few of them, um, and uh, uh, as well as maybe uh, um, walked into to some new challenges. So um, what I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to broadly uh, try to discuss the question of whether newly available administrative data sets link together to create um, what is sometimes referred to as big data. Um, can those types of data sets help us address these challenges uh, and to what extent? Uh, I'm going to do that in the context of a study of eviction uh, in two major urban areas, uh, Chicago and New York. And this is uh, uh, all the results I'm going to show you are from a paper that um, is forthcoming in the uh, quarterly journal of economics. Um, but is most of this research is part of a really long running data collection project that we started uh, in 2016. Um, when uh, most of my co-authors and I were still graduate students at the University of Chicago. Um, and since we're using uh, a lot of uh, administrative data sets, uh, we're working with a lot of different partners. Um, so this is joint work uh, with Robert Collinson at the University of Notre Dame, John Eric Humphreys at Yale, Nick Mader, who's a senior researcher at Chapin Hall, a research institute at the University of Chicago, uh, Devin Reed, who was at the, at the Philly Fed before, uh, and is now at Spotify, and uh, Danny Tenenbaum at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, those are the authors on the paper. Um, but we have benefit, benefited a lot from a very long list of collaborators, some of which are listed here below, but um, uh, importantly and not listed in, is the Inclus Economy Lab at the University of Chicago. Um, so since we're using data from the U.S. Census Bureau, um, I have a disclaimer that I have to uh, make before starting. Um, so. This research was conducted as a part of uh, the Census Bureau's evidence building project series. Uh, none of the conclusions uh, herein are endorsed by the census. They're, they are um, those of the authors. Um, everything has been properly disclosed and um, some of the other uh, institutions that we've worked with to provide data, uh, as well as Devin's former employer to Philly Fed, um, um, uh, all our findings should not be construed as um, their views, they are ours. Okay, so with that, um, what we're gonna think about and talk about is eviction. And so just to get everyone on the same page about what that means, um, eviction is the legal process by which a landlord can remove a tenant from their residence. Um, the first thing to know about eviction is that uh, there are a lot of evictions in the US. Um, in particular, there are over 2 million court cases filed per year in the US. So what I'm showing you here is data from the Princeton Eviction Lab, which collects court records at a national scale. And these numbers are actually a little bit outdated because they have released newer data um, that actually showed that the 2 million number is, is fairly conservative. Um, but about half of these cases uh, tend to end uh, in an eviction order. And throughout the talk, I'm going to refer to an eviction order. So the conclusion of a court case where a judge orders um, the landlord the, or, or, or confers the right on the landlord to ask for an enforcement agency to remove the tenant, I'm going to refer to that as eviction. Okay. Um, so as I said, the number of evictions is large. It's large uh, in, in, in absolute terms, but it's also large when we compare it to, for example, foreclosure filings. Um, I'm an economist. In economics, we have a lot of research that tries to think about um, foreclosure that was spurred uh, by the Great Recession. Comparatively, there's very little research that tries to think about eviction and eviction-related policies. The number or the rate of eviction in the United States is also high uh, when uh, considered in an international perspective. So looking at other high-income countries that are members of the OECD, the US and Canada both stand out as having a high number of initiated eviction proceedings relative to the number of renters. Um, 
as you might expect, um, there's a very high incidence of evictions in poor neighborhoods. So what I'm showing you here is two maps of the two areas that we've been uh, focusing on for our research. On the left is Cook County, that includes the city of Chicago, and on the right is New York City. And this map is showing poverty rates in shades of green and uh, the concentration and number of eviction orders uh, in orange dots. And what you can see is that there is obviously a very high correlation between poverty rates and, uh, and the concentration of evictions. And maybe uh, probably for that reason, as Anna was pointing out, um, these things are clearly very correlated um, and has led people to hypothesize about um, the extent to which eviction uh, has a causal effect on poverty or whether things are the other way around. Um, in response to a lot of the research on eviction coming out, uh, the federal government, as well as states and cities, have expanded their tenant protection policies. Um, so that's a broad category of policies that includes, for example, expansion of legal aid programs, uh, expansion of emergency financial assistance, so two or three months of rent provided to tenants who call 311 reporting being unable to pay their rent or utility bills, um, homelessness diversion programs, uh, just cause eviction ordinance, ordinances, trying to restrict the number of legal arguments that um, landlords are able to make in court, uh, rent control and rent stabilization. And of course, um, during the pandemic, we saw uh, several uh, states and later a, nation a nationwide eviction uh, moratorium. Um, the rationales for these policies always involve either some type of private or social cost of eviction. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, previous work based on ethnographic research or surveys um, has argued that eviction is a cause, not merely a consequence of poverty, basically providing that rationale, um, combining that with estimates of, for example, um, the high cost of local government spending on providing homelessness services um, provides a very powerful rationale for thinking about um, these types of policies. However, as Anna mentioned, uh, measuring the causal effect of eviction is extremely challenging. The logic for that is that, um, as you might expect, eviction is preceded by drops in income, deteriorating health, financial distress of other kinds, um, and this complicates our causal analysis because it is difficult to distinguish between the effect of an eviction and, and therefore the extent to which preventing evictions could change um, the adverse outcomes that we see subsequent to an eviction versus the fallout from things that happened before the eviction was ordered. Um, okay, so the second challenge here is that it is very difficult to um, link eviction court data to other types of data sets. Um, we've, we think we've made a lot of progress here, um, but in the future, in terms of um, data infrastructure building, uh, trying to extend what we've done here in, in, in Chicago and New York to other cities would be extremely valuable. Um, there are also a lot of inconsistencies in definitions and measurements across different studies, so that makes it really hard to compare uh, between uh, different sets of authors or even within one set, one, one team of authors across different publications. Um, and by using this kind of linked data sets, um, for better or worse, we can at least zero in on the things that we can measure and provide very clear definitions of, of um, what appears in our data. Um, so in sum, the challenges that uh, were outlined in 1923 are still present today, and we see them especially in this particular context. Um, so hopefully we'll um, have some time to discuss those. Um, what I'm gonna talk about a little bit is um, the use of administrative data. Um, and what I mean by that is data that derives from the operation of administrative systems. So, for example, national population registers, such as the decennial census, um, tax authorities, state and local government providing local public assistance programs or doing things like assessing properties for um, tax purposes, uh, courts, for example, our eviction filings, but also, for example, criminal sentencing. Um, and finally, uh, under administrative data, um, I would also group private sector data that comes from uh, companies that aggregate information, for example, for marketing purposes. Um, and we use in information of all these types uh, in this study. So what do we do? 
Um, we build on a fairly extensive data collection of about 2.4 million court records for Cook County for the years 2000 to 2016 and New York for the years 2007 to 2016. Um, we link those court records to several data sources uh, that I've grouped here under uh, a number of different headings. So first of all, labor market outcomes, formal earnings, formal employment. Um, second, residential mobility. Do we see people changing addresses? And if so, where are they moving? Um, as well as homelessness, by which I mean uh, making use of the homelessness services system. Um, financial distress, which is a catch-all for the uh, credit report information that um, we're able to link uh, these court records to. Health outcomes, uh, we're able to look at um, hospitalizations. Lastly, we do have this information linked to um, information on educational attainment of children with parents in eviction court. Uh, that's ongoing work that we'll be releasing uh, in the near future, um, but unfortunately I cannot show you that yet today. What we can do with this type of information first is we can characterize what the long run trajectories in these outcomes look like both before and after people interact with eviction court. And that gives us some sense of um, the adverse events and shocks that happen to people before they enter court. But it also lets us study the causal effects of an eviction order. And to be more specific about what we do is we use something that economists call a quasi-experimental research design, which is a type of methodology that is based on court cases that are randomly assigned to different judges where the judges vary in the in the rate at which their cases tend to end in an eviction. So I'll, I'll be more specific about that. Um, but the basic idea here is that um, cases face effectively different eviction chances by virtue of being assigned to different judges. And the fact that we have very large data sets lets us leverage um, the variation that comes from that random assignment. Okay. So this is a visualization of what our, our um, database looks like. Uh, at the center of it, we have the court records. Um, for each court record, we know who the judge is, what the outcome of the court case is, uh, information on the timeline. Um, and we link that um, based on name and address to, for example, um, a data set called the LEHD, which has quarterly earnings and employment information. We also link it to data from HMIS systems or homelessness management information systems, which contain information on whether people use emergency shelter, for example. As I mentioned, we have uh, the data linked to public school records. Uh, we've linked it to uh, both commercial sources, marketing companies, data on addresses, as well as um, address information that resides at the Census Bureau. Um, we've linked to uh, credit report data, um, data from enforcement agencies. So that would be, for example, in Cook County, the Sheriff's Office, that um, once an eviction order is given, um, is the agency responsible for executing it? Um, hospital visits, um, housing assistance, and emergency financial aid. Um, and finally, uh, several of the, um, of the standard surveys that the, the Census Bureau collects. Okay, so I want to place this research in the context of a trend in uh, economics in particular, um, and to some degree in other social sciences, which is uh, a very clear increase in the use of administrative data. Uh, we think this research is, is a good example of that type of research. Um, the thing that uh, I think uh, we've done here that that um, is sort of at the frontier is the fact that we've linked so many data sets together uh, and the fact that we're studying a population that's fairly difficult to study in general. These are people that do not always have formal employment, for example, um, and that comes with both opportunities and challenges. So um, because the data that we use is not collected for the purpose of academic research, um, there's both uh, things about it that are extremely helpful to us and uh, several challenges that I think are worth mentioning. So on the opportunity side, um, we're able, with this type of administrative data, we're able to study new phenomena at scale, and our research is an example of that in particular. Um, before 
the availability of these kinds of data sets, it was very difficult to say something about the full population of people that pass through eviction court, for example. Um, the second thing is that the cost of these types of data sets doesn't scale with the sample size. And so we're able to study subgroups, uh, for example, by race and gender, and we're able to implement econometric analysis, such as the one that we're using here, that are very difficult to implement with smaller data sets. Um, we're also able to look at long run outcomes, which is difficult to do in a lot of um, RCTs, at least uh, uh, um, early on. Um, and we can able we're able to link this to uh, to data to other data sets to uncover relationships that we previously weren't able to study. Finally, um, relative to using, for example, survey data, we think that the benefits here are that um, we don't have to rely on people participating in the research. It's both less costly for the people that we're studying, but also um, there are fewer problems with non-response and having to deal with that in, uh, uh, in, uh, by making assumptions, essentially. Um, so for example, uh, people have uh, discussed a lot the increasing non-response rates in a lot of the large household surveys. That's an issue that we um, don't have to deal with in this particular, uh, in this type of administrative data research. But of course, there are also a lot of challenges here. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have little control over what is being captured. And so as you'll see, there are things that we can measure that we weren't able to measure before, but it's, I'm sure there are still things that um, we would love to be able to measure better and, and hopefully we can talk about that some. Um, there's also a very high fixed cost. And so this research project, for example, has been running for seven years. Um, we've done a lot, uh, uh, a lot of work to both collect a lot of the pieces of data uh, here, but also apply for access um, and then work on uh, uh, linkages that uh, typically require all of that data to not only be accessed once by a researcher, but be brought together in the same place. Um, this data is often poorly documented. That's a challenge. So we need to figure out um, how to properly contextualize it, clean it, and think about it. Um, and this was a little bit less of an issue in our case, but more generally in using linked administrative data sets, um, the size of the data can make it hard uh, to do computation and to store it. Finally, as I mentioned, we're studying a population here that is at the bottom of the income distribution. Um, that's a population that a lot of my research focuses on and administrative data, uh, while extremely helpful, tends to be lower quality for that particular subpopulation. Okay, so with all of that in mind, um, let's take a step back to um, thinking about evictions. Um, the eviction process is fairly similar across different jurisdictions, um, but just to give you an idea, I'm going to um, sketch out what it looks like in Cook County, um, where, uh, uh, which encompasses the city of Chicago. So um, the eviction process starts with the landlord serving notice to the tenant. After uh, the tenant's, tenant receives the notice, um, the notice typically spells out the reason for filing an eviction. A tenant then has time, a uh, specified number of days, to um, deal with the issue that the landlord outlines in their notice. And if the landlord does not agree that, that, is, that the problem is satisfactorily addressed, they may file an eviction case in court. That's the point at which we start seeing um, information in our data set. And that's the point at which a judge is assigned to the court case. A summons will then be served to the tenant, which is followed by one or several hearings. And eventually the, um, the court case concludes with either an eviction order or no eviction order. And importantly, if there is an order for possession, which in Chicago is about two thirds of cases, there may also be a money judgment. Um, a money judgment is a uh, amount of money that the judge orders the tenant to pay to, uh, to the landlord. After the eviction order is issued, the process is basically out of the judge's hands, um, but the landlord now has the ability to file, uh, to file a request with the sheriff's office for um, the eviction to be enforced or executed. Um, they have to pay a fee for that, and they do that in about half of the cases where an eviction order is obtained. Um, after the sheriff receives 
the assignment to enforce the eviction order, um, the enforcement has to actually be scheduled. And there's typically quite a bit of time that passes between um, uh, uh, the sheriff um, receiving the filing and them actually executing the eviction. In the meantime, a tenant may move, for example. And for that reason, we don't always see that the evictions, the eviction orders that are given in court are being enforced. I'm telling you that to sort of sketch um, give you some context for what we're actually able to measure here and able to study here, which is we're going to think about the effect of the eviction order that the judge gives. Okay. So from that timeline and all of the administrative events that happen as a part of it, we try to construct uh, based on different types of data sets, um, a quantitative picture of what is happening. So um, at the notice stage, that's a private interaction between the landlord and the tenant. We don't have information on that. Once the case is filed, it starts appearing in the court archives as well as in um, data sets that are aggregated by commercial parties. So we can collect the information from both of those sources. Um, the summons process runs through the sheriff's office. And um, so as a result, uh, it is subject to a freedom of information request, which we filed. Um, the information on hearings, again, comes from the court archives as well, and uh, as well as the, um, the information on whether an eviction judgment or an eviction order is given. Everything that happens after the eviction order comes from the sheriff's office, again, as they are responsible for the enforcement of the eviction order. Okay. So after having reconstructed the timelines on all of these eviction cases for Chicago, which we've separately done for New York as well, um, we can link them to information on people's economic outcomes pre and post eviction court. Um, and this is what that looks like. So this is uh, a picture of quarterly earnings um, for two groups of people. So the green line represents people who have a case filed in eviction court but are not a bit are evicted, whereas the orange dash line uh, represents people who have a case filed in eviction court but are not evicted. Um, there's a couple of things to notice here. So first, uh, time zero is the time of the eviction filing. Um, what we see is that people who are evicted have lower earnings than people who are not evicted, as you might expect. Um, but importantly, we also see that the dip that both of these groups experience in the run-up to an eviction case being filed is about twice as steep for the people who end up being evicted as it is for the people who are not being evicted. And so that's a first sign that there may be unobservable drivers of these income losses that are different for the people who end up being evicted and the people who end up not being evicted. We can do similar exercises for, for example, residential mobility, which for us is going to be an indicator that we observe you at a different address, um, as well as for the use of homeless services. So that is an indicator for using any kind of service that would be recorded in the homelessness management information system for either of these cities. Um, what we see here uh, on the left is the uh, indicator for not being at the address that people were evicted from. Clearly, uh, people who are being evicted have a higher rate of residential mobility post eviction, but we also see a fairly high move rate among people who don't get evicted, um, which is a fairly natural consequence of the fact that in this, these populations, people are very, uh, tend to be very highly mobile to begin with. Um, we can do a similar thing, for example, for hospital visits. Um, here, what you see, oh, I should mention, we only have this data for New York. Um, what you see here is uh, on the left, the number of, uh, number of hospital visits, on the right, the number of mental health related hospital visits. For both outcomes, we see that there is an increase in this indicator, this proxy for, for underlying health issues. Um, and we see that it is increasing for both groups, but seems to be more steeply increasing for people who end up um, getting an eviction order in court. Okay, so I think that these descriptive um, figures are extremely interesting, uh, but one of the key questions that people have been trying to answer is this question that centers uh, on causality. 
And so what I want to do next is discuss what we do in our research um, to try to answer that causal question. So we're going to rely on something that economists call quasi-experimental methods. Um, and the logic behind that is as follows. Um, it's fairly reasonable to think that eviction court filings are preceded by adverse shocks. So for example, we saw that there was loss of income and we saw that that was more pronounced for people who are end up getting evicted. Um, and, the, and the data are clearly bearing this out on every single variable that we've looked at. Um, and so the question is, how can we separate the effect of the eviction order itself, which is the thing that would be relevant for any type of policy that tries to prevent these eviction orders from happening from the fallout of these prior shocks? A lot of the time, the recipe in science for trying to distinguish correlation from causation is to run an experiment or a randomized control trial. But in the social sciences, that's often very difficult to do. And in our setting, it's particularly hard to imagine that one would implement an RCT that would mimic this effect. And so what we do instead is we use what you might think of as an approximation to an experiment, um, which we're going to call a quasi-experimental research design. And the key idea is that the cases that are filed in court are assigned by a computer algorithm to different judges. Um, we can empirically test this, and in our research, we have uh, uh, several results that um, validate that idea. Um, and empirically, we see that under some judges, the court cases are more likely to end up in an eviction than under other judges. And we're going to label this stringency, even though that's not necessarily um, the clearest term for it. Um, it is the tendency for judges to have uh, a, a higher rate of eviction than, uh, for some judges to have a higher rate of eviction than others. We can then compare the outcomes for cases that are assigned to quote unquote strict versus quote unquote lenient judges. And the estimates that we'll recover from that are going to be informative for the tenants who are, uh, who, who, whose cases are quote unquote on the bubble. So those who receive an eviction order because they were assigned a stricter judge. Okay. Um, and so what we're relying on here is the fact that um, both in Chicago and in New York, there's a lot of variation uh, in terms of the stringency or stringency measure or the average eviction rates uh, for judges. So what I'm showing you here is um, on the left is New York, on the right is Chicago. Um, these are histograms of what we calculate as our um, judge stringency measures. And overlaid with that is a line that's showing the relationship between stringency and the likelihood of receiving an eviction order. So we see that there's both quite a bit of variation in, this, in our stringency measure, and there's a strong relationship between stringency and whether or not your case ends in an eviction. So that's the information that we're going to use to do our analysis. Um, there's a couple more technical details here that um, I'm going to skip over, but you can read about those in the paper. Um, and what I'm going to do next is show you what the results look like. Um, so first, um, the impact on housing situations of tenants in the first year post-court. Um, what I'm showing you here is four different outcomes. Um, the outcomes are labeled on the left-hand side. The number in cursive is the mean outcome for people who are not evicted. So you can think of that as a baseline. And the blue squares are our estimates of the impact of the eviction order on that outcome. So the first outcome is whether we observe you at a different address. So that's our residential mobility measure. And we see that relative to a fairly high baseline of 0.3, um, there is a, an, an, about an eight percentage point increase uh, in the rate at which we see people having moved to a different address. Um, interestingly, we see about a three and a half percentage point increase over a baseline of basically zero uh, in homeless shelter use. And so um, while that may appear in absolute terms like not a huge number, in relative terms, that is very, very large. Um, we also have an indicator for using any sort of homelessness services. So that includes also longer term types of assistance. In the short term, we don't see uh, evidence of 
people using those types of services, it's really very concentrated on the emergency shelter use. Interestingly, we don't see uh, an effect on people moving to poor neighborhoods. A lot of the people that are in eviction court live in poor neighborhoods. Um, and so as a result, we kind of think of uh, the effect of eviction as running mostly through having to move and housing instability, potentially a, a time in shelter, rather than a type of neighborhood effect. Um, that neighborhood poverty effect uh, remains uh, uh, basically a zero uh, throughout the entire period that we're able to look at. Um, okay, so in the short run, we see pretty uh, uh, clear impacts on people's housing situation, both moving to a different address, but a different group of people entering shelter, um, uh, but not so much a change in neighborhood effects. In the longer run, uh, we can ask, what does that type of housing instability, um, what type of impact does that have on, on longer run outcomes of the type that we're able to look at in our data set? Um, so first, let's establish that um, that residential mobility effect persists over time. So what I'm showing you here is estimates for residential mobility in the second year. Um, this is a persistent effect also in the longer term, but we see about a 10 percentage point increase over time in the probability of having moved. And the other thing this figure is doing is it's splitting out our estimates into different uh, demographic groups. So we're doing this by gender and by um, Black versus non-Black tenants. Both uh, women and Black tenants are strongly overrepresented in court. Um, and so we think these are important groups to look at for that reason, but also uh, qualitative research has pointed out that the impacts of eviction are potentially most severe for those groups. And what you can see in this figure, and you'll see that also in the other figures for other outcomes, is that there tends to be a pattern where those two groups do seem to be driving the overall estimates. So in particular, what we're seeing here is that the point estimate for the subgroup of female tenants is larger than for the other groups um, and is statistically significant while it is not for the other groups. For homeless services use, um, so this is the longer term effects. What we saw earlier was a short term effect on emergency shelter use. That effect does not persist or we don't find evidence that it persists. We do find evidence that in the longer run people um, end up using homeless, uh, homelessness services broadly interpreted. Um, and again, in particular, we're seeing that those estimates, those overall estimates at the top, the blue squares, are being driven by the estimates for female and black tenants. Um, on earnings, we see decreases in earnings. Uh, we, saw, we see that also in the first year, um, but what I'm showing you here is the second year. Uh, and again, we see that that's being driven by those two uh, subgroups at the top. For employment, we actually don't see a statistically uh, significant effect that is uh, different from zero. Um, the only subgroup for whom we do see that is for Black tenants. Um, and then finally, uh, while for all of the outcomes I've shown you so far, with the exception of residential mobility, um, we don't find evidence of effects that persist beyond the, the two years post eviction court. For financial health, the story is a little bit different. Um, we see uh, when we compute an index based on all of the credit information that we have, we see that there are negative effects in the first year. There's not much evidence of an effect in the second year. Um, but then in the longer run, um, partly because people build up uh, the amount of debt in collections and they have decreases in credit scores, we see uh, sort of a persistent effect in, in our financial health index um, that summarizes all of the hundreds and hundreds of pieces of information that go into somebody's credit report. Okay. Um, lastly, for New York, we're able to look at hospital visits um, and we see uh, some evidence that in the short run, the first year, there's an increase in the number of hospital visits. We're not able to say much beyond uh, that in terms of what types of hospital visits. And uh, that effect does not persist beyond the first year, somewhat consistent with 
um, what we saw earlier in the first year, very acute impacts on um, homelessness and moves um, that, that are maybe correlated also with um, emergency, uh, emergency room visits. So to summarize, um, we see that uh, we see a very, very high fraction of tenants that are interacting with housing courts on an annual basis. So in particular, we saw an over 15% eviction filing rate in some of the census tracts in both Chicago and in New York. Um, we've used our data to document that the court filings tend to be preceded by shocks to income, employment, financial distress, and signs of worsening physical and mental health. And that means that it's very difficult to distinguish correlation from causation in this setting. So we've used our newly linked data set and quasi-experimental research design um, to try to shed some light on that. And we find that an eviction order increases residential mobility and homelessness, um, in particular homeless shelter in the short run and use of more general homelessness related services in the longer run. Um, and we find evidence of decreases in earnings, credit access and durable goods consumption. Um, on top of that, we find that for the outcomes where we are able to split according to demographic subgroups, which are the housing and labor market impacts, um, we see that those effects are very clearly driven by female and Black tenants, which is at least consistent with the qualitative research that I mentioned earlier. So a couple of concluding thoughts on um, this type of research and this study in particular. Um, first, there's a lot of outstanding questions related to eviction that are very important to study, some of which we're working on and some of which I hope other people will work on. Um, so for example, how common is eviction for households with children? One of the things that I haven't shown you is um, among all of these households that we're able to look at in the census data, how many of them um, have children in the household? Um, that's something that we're working on. Um, we're also working on studying the causal effects of eviction on children's educational outcomes. Um, we don't yet have data on health outcomes um, or later in life outcomes, and all of those are, are very important dimensions of, um, of children's well-being. Um, another group that we've left out here is elderly tenants. So we specifically looked at people where we might think that there are labor market impacts of an eviction. Um, elderly tenants are actually a, a fairly large group of tenants, um, and they're a group where health impacts in particular may be uh, a very important dimension of outcomes to look at. Um, secondly, um, a host of tenant protection reforms have been proposed both in the years uh, before the pandemic, but especially during the pandemic, and uh, the work on evaluating those and trying to understand how they might rank amongst each other um, is still largely not done. Um, so a couple of these examples we I mentioned in the introduction, um, a really important piece of this is how to account for um, potential market and landlord responses to these policies. That is something that we as economists are um, perhaps well equipped to think about. Um, and uh, some exciting work has been coming out trying to think about that, conceptualize it and measure it. Um, and then lastly, um, because we do see that um, adverse events happen to tenants in the run-up to eviction court, is it possible to target assistance programs to tenants before an eviction case is filed, and how should we do that? Okay. Um, so the second thing that I wanted to uh, uh, briefly bring up is the fact that these court interactions are very common in low-income neighborhoods. So in our data, we see a 15% eviction filing rate in some neighborhoods, um, but there's a couple of other just quick descriptive statistics that bear out something similar. So for example, um, a 2005 Legal Service Corporation report uh, documented that 71% of low-income households needed civil legal services in the past year. So eviction falls on their civil legal services, um, but is by no means the only type of um, civil court processes that low-income households deal with. Um, when I was looking into uh, the history of the SSRC, one of the things that I uh, also came across is a 1988 description of the program on urban poverty that Anna mentioned in the introduction, um, which mentioned a study uh, on North Lawndale, which is a, a Chicago neighborhood, um, and had the statistic that 5% of the community's youth were refer referred to court in the year 1980 alone. Um, I thought that was a that was a shocking statistic. Um, 
and kind of lines up with what we're seeing in these other bullet points. So lastly, um, something that I've been re doing research on, I know, and has been doing research on as well, is um, the effect of uh, convictions, criminal records. Um, in the U.S., 8% of adults and 33% of Black men have uh, a felony conviction. Taking all of these numbers together paints a picture of the court system as being potentially hugely influential, um, obviously for everyone, but maybe particularly so for low-income households and people who reside in low-income neighborhoods. And these administrative data linkages and the quasi-experimental approach to doing research can help us understand how the design of the court system affects um, people's lives. Um, and that was a, a theme that, although many of the, the themes that we uh, uh, that were in that description of the urban poverty uh, research agenda from the 1980s uh, were very clearly related to the discussion today. Um, the design of the court system was not in there. And, and I feel like that's something that maybe with the availability of these types of data sets is um, something that we'll see a lot more research on. So thirdly, and I, I know we're almost out of time, um, the question of progress. Uh, related to the challenges that were outlined in the 1923 report. Um, we think that there has been a lot of progress in terms of data availability. Um, our research is an example of that. We have data now on use of homelessness services. We have data on residential addresses. We have data on evictions. And because we previously didn't have data on evictions, I think that's one of the reasons why there wasn't as much attention to this as a research topic or a policy topic. Um, so both for research and for policy attention, having that data available has made a big difference. Um, in terms of interpretation, um, this type of secondhand data is going to narrow the scope for researchers for uh, for researchers to shape the data collection process. Um, that may be a good thing, but it's important to be aware that biases might also come in earlier before the data is collected and as it's recorded by people into administrative systems. Um, on measurement, this quantitative approach, I think, can help uh, clarify definitions. So one example of that is that we're very clear about the fact that what we're measuring here is the effect of an eviction order in court. Um, the term eviction has been used much more broadly, and sometimes that's helpful, but a lot of the times it kind of muddles the discussion. So we think that that's progress as well. On the other hand, because we don't have a hand in how the data is collected, that also means that there are things that we cannot measure. Um, and then lastly, and most obviously, the causality question, um, these types of quasi-experimental research methods are, are a game changer for what we're able to do and what we're able to say um, in terms of new policies coming out. Um, I think our research is just one example of, of many um, that have been coming out in the last decades, um, as you saw in that um, earlier figure. Um, and uh, we anticipate this only becoming a larger uh, share of economics research and maybe other social science research. Um, so one last thought is that um, although our research is very quantitative and is a very particular type of, uh, uh, requires a very particular type of skills, um, we do think that this research actually illustrates the complementarities between qualitative or what you might call qualitative and quantitative approaches to doing social science research. Um, and I found this quote in the report on the SSRC program on urban poverty, making a very similar point that um, to study ur urban poverty, what is required is a diversity of disciplines and a range of research methodologies. Um, and they make an argument that in a very different context, uh, more quantitative studies are considerably enriched if they are coupled with ethnographic evidence. And conversely, qualitative descri descriptions are more meaningful if we know something about the frequency uh, with which we're likely to encounter the phenomena they describe. And I, I think sort of our the research that we've done and, and the pre-existing research um, that was largely done by, um, uh, by sociologists and anthropologists are highly complementary and are a good example of how even when these things are executed by different research teams with different skill sets, um, comparing and contrasting evidence across these different studies is incredibly useful. Okay, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Anna. Thank you so much, Winnie. That was great. I really appreciate it. Um, and it was so nice of you to end <laughs> on that note. You know, the Social Science Research Council has, has always been um, method inclusive.
with the idea that we're likely to get further on solving important problems if we bring all the tools that we have to bear on, on addressing that problem. So we have um, a ton of questions here, and so I'll just start going through them. And I can always send you the questions afterwards um, for those that we don't have a chance to get through. Sorry, I did not. I did not look at the questions. Oh yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. I'll, I'll, we'll make sure you get them. Um, so interestingly, uh, uh, there's a bunch of nerdy questions about exactly how you linked these different data sets, um, and I wanted to start with that. You know, you're you're linking out from these court records. So is you know, do you get things like social security numbers and the court records where you can do these like really clean, you know, person to person linkages with the earnings and employment? Or are you doing like kind of name, you know, name matches? Or are, are you linking households using addresses? Could you say just a little bit more of that, just because of interest yeah, in the nitty gritty details? Of course. Um, so eviction court records typically only have name and address. So that is the information that we have to link on. Um, a lot of the other data sets that we use don't have name and address. They'll have, for example, name and social security number. And so what's actually really crucial and this is kind of nerdy, but uh, what's actually really crucial to doing these kinds of linkages is that you do them in a place where you have um, something like a backbone or a spine of information where I can take, let's say, court records that have name and address. My spine has name and address and social security. I link both my earnings records with names and social security and my eviction records with names and address to the spine, and then I can link them to each other. Whereas if I had done that directly between those two data sets, it would, I would have done a, uh, not a great job. And so um, it's actually really important, or what was incredibly important for us in doing this study is having partnerships with organizations like the US Census Bureau, like Chapin Hall, that are able to do those linkages for us based on some of the spine or backbone information that they already have. Um, so I don't know if that answers all of the all of the questions, yeah, um, but it, it does mean that uh, our name and address information is not it is not a hundred percent match rate. Uh, and so one of the things that is incredibly important here to think about is one uh, the quality of the match. Uh, how do we achieve that? Um, I think there uh, there's a bunch of techniques for doing that, but I think there's probably scope for um, uh, for improvement. Uh, especially when it comes to names and addresses. Um, yeah, and it's and it's a place where I think people are innovating, right? Like trying to get us better and better algorithms for matching those. But this exactly. raises another question because there's a footnote in your paper and I read it and my heart just sank. It just absolutely sank. And the footnote was something to the effect of New York wouldn't allow you to link to the census. And I would just want to say something about that, which was crazy to me, is that the, the LEHD, the earnings and employment data that, that are housed by, you know, they're in the census, then you know, you have to go to the restricted data centers to access their, they're like they have the one of the spines and you can access the other, you know. Okay, those are contributed by the state. So New York State, that data comes from New York State, right? And so New York State still wouldn't let you link. It just do you, can you say anything about that? I mean, just like what the heck? Um, uh, I guess so. I mean, we've tried very hard. Uh, we have, I have, I have many, uh, um, letters, correspondences with the person in charge. Um, and this is a no-go. Um, that's very unfortunate. Obviously, I think the, the implication of that is that, um, we're not, um, able to do that census linkage for the New York data. Um, I'd love to be able to do that. Uh, and if the opportunity ever arises, we will, um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's uh, um, there's not not everyone is equally interested in, in um, people taking a close look at uh, what happens in eviction court. Um, and on top of that, there's also sometimes concerns about tenant privacy, right? Like rightfully so. Um, in New York, in particular, there have been has been some legislation around um, not uh, uh, the court system not being allowed to sell the information. Um, as a result, they've interpreted that as they're not allowed to provide the information at all. So they can't provide it to us for free for research purposes because they're not allowed to sell it. Uh, whether those are exactly the same thing, I will leave to lawyers to interpret. But um, unfortunately, that's the reason they're signing. Yeah, and it just it's just as illustrative of the of the challenges of and I, I absolutely agree with you of all of the benefits of administrative data, particularly in an era when you know, surveys are just getting more and more expensive and 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 lower quality. 
Um, but then the challenge is particularly for junior researchers to have to put all of this effort. I mean, you guys said you're a graduate student, seven years and what, five people um, to just navigate all of these different data sharing agreements. And um, so it's super impressive, but I just wanna make sure people understand how hard this is um, and how many roadblocks there are to doing it in the United States. Um, a couple other questions here. One is about the potential importance of of records um, for the outcomes. So in the criminal justice context, one of the things, and I know you're working on this too, um, one of the things we're starting to learn about is the importance of not just the enforcement actions that actors take in the criminal justice system, but then the, the records of those, which, which endure. Um, and you, on, on your graphic, you know, you, you, I think as soon as the filings start, um, there are, I assume it's credit reporting companies that are in there, you know, whether it's scraping data or doing something and pulling them into records. I guess two questions. One, do you know how, are you able to disentangle, you know, the mechanisms at all in your work? How much is, how much of the eviction consequences are due to the instant, you know, you have been evicted versus the, the effects of the records? Um, and then two, are there any policy efforts to, around, around record sealing, record clearing, anything like that, that like we've, what we've seen in the, in the criminal justice context? Yeah, um, so so we actually cannot speak to the effect of the filing because what we're doing is comparing people who um, all have a filing and some of them receive an eviction order at the end of the court process and others don't. And so our comparison cancels out any possible effect of the filing. And that's a really important piece that I probably should have put on uh, my outstanding question slide is, um, specifically, can we say anything about the role of having a record as um, as separate from um, these impacts? So it's not so much that they are confounded with the with the um, estimates that we are estimating. Um, it's that it might be an additional impact on top of that that affects both people who end up getting evicted and people who uh, end up not getting evicted. Um, we've been trying to do some work around that related to. Um, or using the fact that during the pandemic, a lot of courts sealed records and then unsealed or stopped doing that, but then didn't unseal the previously sealed records. Um, and so we're, we've been trying to do comparisons between um, cases that were sealed up to a given date um, after which the cases were released. Uh, um, and so I, I think we're still working on that. I, hopefully that can shed some light on that. Um, it'd be great um, for people to come up with other types of uh, approaches for trying to understand that better. And it's definitely something that's that's not included in our um, in our estimates. That's um, a, that's a, yeah, I was just you got trying to similar to ban the box type of policies um, uh, specifically in New York. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great natural experiment if you can make it work. Right, the fact that the, the interruption of the sharing of records, because um, because we we do face this question about is it the records is it something else? Um, so one an, another question here um, about uh, about using these um, the development the evolution of these quasi experimental designs like these judge leniency designs. Um, you know, I had a conversation the other day with um, some foundations have have been at the forefront of trying to support research that um, allows us to get you know, better, more reliable policy guidance, which is kind of in the DNA of, of the SSRC. Um, like Arnold Ventures, for instance, has you know, funded a number of randomized controlled trials. They and, actually, uh, or the, the John and Laura Arnold Foundation funded this research indirectly. That's, okay, so this is, this is a great segue then because um, you know, many of the, you kind of brought this up, many of the RCTs that they have funded are kind of, you know, one shot trials, maybe in one city with, you know, relatively short time horizons of measurement. And they, they're they they're asking the question of how can we go bigger? How can we, you know, scale to multiple cities and have longer time horizons? And one of the things that people like me have suggested is fund more of the quasi-experimental work which like yours, because you have New York and Chicago and you have this nice long time horizon. And one of the responses we've gotten is that, you know, yeah, but that work is actually a lot harder to evaluate. It's like harder to understand. It's, it's not, it's, there's something about an RCT that's kind of transparent. And what's the, what's a good answer for that? For a foundation is says, yeah, but geez, I, I don't know if I even really understand this like instrumental variable design that you've come up with here. Um. So you mean in, in terms of explaining these types of research designs to a broader audience? 
Well, in terms of like somebody's applying in here, we, you know, and we have to distinguish between, you know, the observational study that can get at causal inferences and the one that can't, it's actually feels like a hard task. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think um, to some degree, more and more, I feel like there's an evolution in sort of the sophistication of these research designs, but also how common they are and sort of how yeah. good we're getting at explaining them and uh, getting to sort of what is the essence of the assumptions that we're really making here. And um, hopefully with time, they become a little bit more commonplace, like the basic RCT, and it becomes something that um, people feel uh, a little bit more familiar with and, and have an easier time judging. Um, yeah, I, I feel like that's a matter of communication that we need to um, emphasize and 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 incentivize. Yeah, I think it's really important. And of course, there's like 50 other questions here, but we're um, we're already out of time. So so I'll send them to you. And my thanks to everybody in the audience for engaging and, and submitting such great questions. Thanks to Winnie for taking the time to be here today. Super interesting. I wish we could go for another hour. Um, so again, thank you, Winnie, for 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 being with us today. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good afternoon.